Hi, everyone. Thank you for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. I hope I can yeah. do it for a while. We'll wait for uh, a minute for people to trickle in. And in the meantime, Mark, um, so every, as everyone saw, there's a link to, to one of Mark's incredible libraries, which I can highly recommend. It's called Rain. And yeah, please tell us a little bit about it. <laughs> that's, that's a great library. And I'm really proud of it because, and it's very fresh. It's some of the newest recordings I've made um, published through prosoundeffects.com. Uh, who um, distributes my entire library, but we love doing these little subsets uh, that are super useful for sound designers. And this one was a real uh, pet project of mine because for so many years when I encountered a rain scene in a film, um, I had rain recordings in my library, but none of them were immersive. And of course, you could, as you can imagine, if you like to record, you know that when you record rain, you probably don't want to get wet. And that means that you're probably pointing the microphone at rain, but you're probably not in the middle of rain. And that was what I was missing in what I wanted to create sonically. So this predominantly is an immersive rain library um, that is uh, amassed by using a number of different miking techniques that includes a holophone H1, which was an eight channel uh, surround microphone, um, uh, an Ambio Ambisonics microphone, um, a multi Shep CCM 41 mic rig that I custom built. And then I made a, a, a custom rain protection rig so that I could put the microphone out in pouring rain and you wouldn't hear any dripping on top of the microphone. And you got these really beautiful immersive um, rain sound fields. And, and secondly, I found that most rain recordings in my library had a noise quality and they didn't have a wet quality. And I found that the, the secret was in casting the locations very carefully and, and um, setting mic positioning very carefully so that you got splatty, drippy sound and not that kind of that heavy rain tends to lean towards. So I'm real proud of it and hope some folks here might find some value in it and go over to Pro Sound Effects or on, I think on your side, on a sound effect now, they're also carrying my rain library. So check it out. Thanks. Yeah, and it's on sale as well. So definitely go grab it. <laughs> it's awesome. Um, but yeah, in that case, we've got a bunch of people now. So thank everyone for showing up. I'm going to roll with the intro now. So hello, everyone. I am super excited and honored to be joined by Oscar-winning sound designer Mark Mangini, who is really a true legend in the audio industry and has, oops, and has, wait, one second, I think we just lost Mark, potentially. <laughs> All right. Technical issues. We got this, we got this. Hang in there, everyone. <laughs> ah, there we go. Mark is back. Excellent. Oh, something dropped out. Apologies. Where no problem. I... We're back. Okay. We're back. We'll we'll resume again with the intro. So yeah, incredibly honored to be joined by uh, by you, Mark, Oscar-winning sound designer, true legend in the audio industry. You've brought many worlds on the cinema screen to life through sound, including titles such as Dune, Blade Runner twenty forty nine, Mad Max Fury Road, and many, many, many more. Too many to name. Um, yeah, thank you so much, Mark, for taking the time today with me and the whole Air Wiggles community and, and the greater um, game and film audio community at large to talk Ooh. and nerd out about audio. Welcome. Great. Thanks. A, a pleasure to be here. Um, uh, mea culpa, I've been in narrative cinema all my life. I hope something I say today is of value to the gaming community. Love it. I actually had to study Latin in school. Fun fact. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, um, so on a topic, since we're on the topic of field recording and, and went into a little bit about your rain library, you just talked about kind of building these these custom mic um, arrays and everything and, and everything. Yeah, super cool stuff. What for you is the process when recording new source for a film? Um, the, it's, it's fairly simple. Uh, it begins with an analysis of the film and I'm a big, I'm a list keeper and a list maker. And I, I will review a film many, many times to develop essentially two specific lists. One is 
what sounds do I need for the film that I don't have in my library? And that kind of gets broken down into two subsets, which is what sounds do I not have in my library and a must get? And what sounds do I have in my library, but I want to do better with? So there's, there's a sort of list of, okay, Mark's going to go out in the field, as it were. I mean, often those recordings take place right here uh, in my home studio. Uh, and then the second list is what sounds do I want to record that will become fodder for design elements? And so that list um, is easy to create um, initially because I know, oh, I have to make a sandworm or I have to make an ornithopter. And I know what the topics are, but I don't know exactly yet what sounds might comprise them. So once I know what the design list is, then I break that down into groups of things that I might want to focus on that I know I'll bring back into the studio and manipulate later. And then it's uh, simply a process of finding the time and the wherewithal to um, go out and actually capture these recordings. Now, so for example, on Blade Runner 2049, the, the script was replete with scenes in the rain, but I live in Southern California. So this was a fool's errand to think that I could put rain on my record list. But as, as fate would have it, um, we had in 2019, 2020, epic rains that hadn't been seen in Southern California in a hundred years. So this was to my, to my gain. And I quickly began assembling the components of microphones and rigs to go out and capture. And I would, my, my wife would tell you that I would be out at three in the morning, often by myself in a big, like a, a big box store parking lot, which was because it's the biggest empty space you can find without traffic alone <laughs> with a microphone out in the rain being, being drenched. So that's, 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 that's part of that process. Wow. Yeah. I mean, this is, it's definitely, I guess, taking work, so to speak, above and beyond. <laughs> and that is a part of being an audio designer, I guess. It's, it's really, you live and breathe sound. Yeah. You, you know, um, I, I love to record and that's the, one of those funny things where I, I don't like to be the person that encourages people not to have a real life and a home life, but um, I record because it's something I love. I do that instead of, say, golfing or some other hobby that somebody else might have. So it's fortunate that something I love to do services what I do during the day. But it's I think it's a vital part of what we do. And often, even at my level, and I don't mean to to, to brag, I get really good budgets and really good schedules. Probably nothing like the people who are watching this this podcast. And even still, I don't get proper recording budgets so this all always falls almost always falls on me to make the recording happen if i want my movie to be as bespoke as possible yeah this is interesting this is actually something i wanted to bring up anyway so you've just answered that question so in that case um when you do have a recording budget is it mostly um very specific for things like say guns or, or something like that and then you figure out how to flesh out the rest or is it kind of you get to very much decide what what's worth worth recording so to speak what what the budget needs to be spent on essentially often it's very specific only because it's it's an easier sell to the producer you know if you're doing a war film um you might want to plug into your budget a little line item that says sherman tank because if they don't pay for the rental of the Sherman tank and the space that you're going to record it in, um, you might not get around to that later on in post when you, you hadn't really thought of it. Um, it. That's a much easier sell and, and it's easier for them to envision, oh yeah, you know, production didn't really capture it correctly. Those were half loads. They don't have the boom that we want. Mark's going to get something really great in the field. Um, so that's something you want to preordain as much as possible. And yes, and of course, something like guns, which we all love to do, is an obvious candidate. You know, anything that's going to require a significant expenditure on the part of the production is, is smart to have as a line item in your budget for record. And then, you know, I mean, I probably wouldn't put, um, you know, if I did a haunted house, I probably wouldn't 
put a blind item for, you know, creaky doors or something simple like that. <laughs> Those are the kinds of fun things we go out and do ourselves. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Um, excuse my ignorance, but in that case, how often do you find yourself on set as well and potentially um, taking a recorder with you for if they do have a real replica of the Sherman tank and then there might be an opportunity or something like that or the real thing, not a replica, but yeah. Sure. Uh, for me, not often enough. I, I, I work so much that a film that's shooting usually is happening while I'm in post-production on another project. It has happened an, enough times that it's been really fun to do that where you go to production and while they're off with the main unit shooting, you can steal the horse and carriage or you can steal the sports car or the Sherman tank and go off with a, a couple of assistants and, and capture that beautifully. So that that's super value. You know, you know, there's value to the production to that. The cost of flying you in with your rig while the tank is already being paid for by the production. Or a, an even better example is you're in a stadium and you, you've, you've paid for 30,000 extras for a, a sports match of some kind to be able to that, you know, do you know what that costs to a production? You had to reproduce it later. So to be able to show up between takes and with a big bullhorn and direct them to shout something like we did on Mad Max Fury Road, like, uh, son, bring them up, bring them up to have 20,000 people really do that outside instead of 20 actors in a, in a recording studio has significant value. And that, that often is 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 patently obvious to the producers and they 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 usually green light something like that that must feel incredibly powerful having the the control over the <laughs> thirty thousand crowd yeah that. that's awesome it's pretty fun um in terms of so i saw i saw a video recently of you um when i was looking a bit into the whole soundscape of Dune after I watched it and was totally blown away by it. And one of the things I saw was you burying mics in the desert. <laughs> and yeah. uh, and that seems like such a genius idea. How do you come up with this kind of like craziness? Well, um, I would have done it. That was um, that was thought of by Theo Green, my my co-supervisor. Um, only because both of us leading up to starting on Dune had an awareness of the singing sand dunes. And this is something we wanted to capture as atmosphere for the film. As you may or may not know, um, large sand dunes in the right environment, meaning the right humidity and temperature with the right composition of crystalline sand, uh, when, the, when mass amounts of the sand shift, they create these deep groaning sounds that we call the singing sand dunes. And you can see these, just look up singing sand dunes on, on YouTube and you'll see National Geographic clips about it. And they make the most lovely undulating groans and moans. And this is something we wanted to uh, inhabit our uh, soundscape, our, our, our atmospheres. And so we knew there was already this kind of geological kind of effect happening that we could leverage with the right microphones. And it seemed obvious that not only should we have above air microphones to capture the sounds as our, our ears hear it, we wanted to have the subterranean sound um, uh, captured uh, to see what did that sound like under the ground. We didn't really know what we were gonna get till we got there, but we did bury hydrophones and as well as traditional above air microphones with balloons and condoms wrapped around them to protect them underneath the sand. And we just got the most fantastic sounds. It, it, it's just a way of thinking kind of a little bit laterally, laterally, which is to say, we know the sound we want, but how else could we mic it to, to yield something that you didn't expect or the ear wasn't really looking for? And it was in that process where we discovered the thumper. Um, it, we brought um, heavy mallets and we use that for the sound, the subterranean sound, the way the worm might have heard it subter in the subterranean space when uh, the thumper was pounding on, on the sand. So we just brought a regular rubber mallet and hit the sand and the sounds that you hear in the film are exactly as recorded. There's no processing, there's no plugins. That's our that's our hydrophones underground. But we planned to do it like six or seven of them, so we made it kind of an immersive space. 
that's incredible. Mind blowing to me as well that that it's basically unprocessed. How much processing in in general do you often tend to do with the source? Because um, uh, for me, I am a big kind of on both sides. I'm a recording nerd, but I also love plugins, and I tend to kind of record whatever I get my hands on, and then often bring it through crazy plugin chains, modulate everything, re-record that, and then you know so on and so forth. Are you very much um, kind of pure source or what's your approach? I'd say that I am, I use a, I have, a, I use a very light touch with processing. I mean, um, it's not just because I'm of a certain age, but I'm a traditionalist. Uh, to me, um, I like the, my most commonly used techniques are slow down and speed up reverse and manipulation of, of direction of speed. Um, the plugins are, can be addictive. Um, oh, yeah. and, and I find that plugins are a good way to start to pull the life and the soul out of a sound. I, I find that if I'm in searching for a sound I haven't heard before, I'm more productive for looking for a metaphorical sound in in the real acoustic world that tells that story. I find that to be more effective than twiddling knobs and electronifying something to try to alter something and beat it into shape. I'd rather find something that's already in the shape and then do something very subtle and simple with it. So, um, and, and this, brings us back to Dune a little bit because um, that it was part of our design aesthetic. And I want to put that in quotes, design aesthetic, because I think every film should have a design aesthetic. It's, it's your kind of modus operandi. It's the way you hear the universe you're going to build and encompass the film in. And our modus operandi on, on Dune was no electronic sounds. Denis had said to us early in, in our uh, work on sound that he wanted the film to sound as though it had been captured by a documentary crew dropped on Arrakis. So what did that mean? That means it should sound like somebody with a boom pole recorded everything that you hear, even though 99% of that film had to be fabricated from whole cloth. We had to make sounds that no one has ever heard before sound like they had heard them before. What does that mean? Start with acoustic sound. Start with sounds, but extract them from the, the, the cinematic reality they are in and try to find a metaphor somewhere in life that mimics it, that will be familiar to the ear. And then we can get into the science of believability and verisimilitude. To me, the best way to make a thing you've never heard before sound real is to have it start with an acoustic element because there are tells in all acoustic sound, the, the pre-reverbs and, and the LD, LT, uh, what's the time arrival, time delay. Um, and those tells trick the brain into checking a box that says that sounded real. So we built of the 3000 or so bespoke sounds in Dune, for example, only four or five of them were made with synthesizers or some kind of electronic device. And that, that, that's a way of saying um, our design aesthetic started with make things sound acoustic and real and believable. Yeah, I love that. And it's so cool as well to, to see directors like Denis um, put such care into sound. I think that's really special. And, and it really goes to show uh, on a film like Dune or Blade Runner where so much of it, the whole storytelling is is really show don't tell and that has yeah just really like you nailed it basically but i'm really curious as as an expert kind of sonic storyteller what are some of the biggest things you've learned um in your career about telling um the sound of of a cinematic experience uh, sorry the, the cinematic experience through sound well one would be sound is an extraordinarily efficient storytelling tool. It took me a really, really long time to learn this. And the reason was that I never took any 
I didn't go to film school. I'm not even a college graduate. Um, and I never understood the mechanics of storytelling or acting or directing. And it wasn't until I began to study those disciplines myself that I began to make the connections between what the director was trying to do dramatically and how sound could help support that storytelling effort. And that, and what that means is I studied writing and I studied acting and I took comedy improv classes and I even took cinematography classes because I wanted to learn to extract from what I had been given, which is here's a movie, look at it and figure out the, you know, the sound you're gonna make for it. And whereas in early in my career, I, I, I was very kind of diegetic. Like if I saw something, I had to make a cool sound for it. But I began to discover that the more the sound had a, a narrative connection to the story, like the, what I learned to do is ask myself why. Once I understood why I was making a sound, the making of the sound became that much easier. When you understand a character's motivation, if, does a character have anxiety? Does a character want to be happy? Does a character want to be in a place of calm? Does a character feel like they look calm, but they're in the midst of turmoil? All of those are little dramatic handles that a writer might put in parentheses in a script that you can use to interpret and bring sound that tells that part of the story versus oh, I see some trees, I'm gonna put birds in this scene. Well, what if this person has just suffered some serious emotional trauma? Maybe you don't want birds to tell the story that all is safe and bucolic in the suburbs. Maybe it's something completely different than that. So the, 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 the big takeaway here is first understand what any given scene or beat in, a, in, the, in the project is, is that what is it trying to say? Where is it leading you dramatic and emotionally? And what can sound do to tell that story and or tell it more efficiently? And though that's, that's a super valuable lesson. And I, and, and I would encourage anyone listening to do things like study screenwriting, study storytelling, study acting, so that you can deconstruct a performance. And then you, when you start to see these little nuances, these little ticks, you start to gather information. You think, oh, you know, this sound will mean so much more because that character thinks or feels this. Yeah, definitely. And it's it's also incredible in, in terms of how the in, in those films, like specifically Dune and Blade Runner as well, the score is crosses this really there's this blurry line between the sound itself the sound design and the score and in a lot of films it's very much like here's the score here's the sound they're kind of separate but mm. in this it's it's really kind of one big audio experience what is it like working with the composer during that to make it that way well, it it very it, it's it's thrilling with a director like Denis Villeneuve because he is very clear on the contribution that sound is going to make and music is going to make, and he's he's encouraging collaboration between those departments through his vision of the film. So both the we know that the composer knows and the composer knows that we know that this is what Denis wants and that we are we are meant to share and not be antagonistic with each other. What, what Denis is, is ultimately trying to get to, which I think is a very progressive idea and very few directors have gotten to yet, is that when you get to the final mix, you want th there to be a certain harmony there where you've done the hard work. You won't, you, he doesn't want to be, and the filmmaker shouldn't be deciding at the final mix. Uh, you know, I know there's a lot of good sound there, but I want to hear the cue. Or no, you know what? The sound is really good here. Let's not use the cue. And all of that makes for a big mess and the mixers don't know what to do. If, if you are thoughtful about that approach, you can achieve so much success. So much so that, for example, on Blade Runner 2049, um, Denis, one of the many things that Denis instructed Theo and I to do was to quote, erase the boundaries. He didn't want the audience to know where music ended and sound started and vice versa. That achieves a, a number of really valuable things cinematically. One, it creates a level of coordination and cohesion so that we're all working for the same purpose. 
But more importantly, on a subconscious level, he's done something very clever. When you go see a film, and especially people in this audience, you are very likely watching a movie, enjoying it, but you're, you, you're, you're, your subconscious is checking a box. Oh, that was a cool sound effect. I love that music cue. And for those beats, 5, 10, 15, 20 times throughout a film, you got distracted from what's happening on screen because your brain just did a little bit of mathematics. Oh, I wonder how he made that sound. I wonder, that's a really beautiful music cue. It sounds like, and you're not in the moment anymore. So if we can erase the boundaries, we allow the audience to fully participate and engage and fully suspend disbelief. Because the minute you say, that's a cool sound effect, that's a cool music cue, you are aware of the artifice of filmmaking because it's all fake. It's interesting that that's um, I recently talked to um, some of the folks at Molinaire who are primarily working Foley. And they also said, like, with Foley, obviously, soon as Foley is detected, it's <laughs> not right because you should never realize it's there. Right. That's that's really good. You should feel it. Maybe not hear it. <laughs> and you know, uh, I, I and... want to say I just saw a, a thing in the chat. I just want to say something. Gemma Hooper just said something really interesting about the five senses. Um, sound, one of the reasons I think sound is so important and so vital in cinema is that it, in fact, encompasses two senses. Your ear is stimulated intraocular by the little cilia being vibrated by sound waves. And you hear the, those electrical impulses are tr translated into sound. And yet sound is also tactile because sound is waves that you feel on your skin. So it's kind of two senses for one. Thank you, Gemma, for that little reminder. Yeah, that's true. That's a great point, actually. And um, that actually brings up something interesting as well, which which I've I've heard you say in a video as well before, and I think a lot of people struggle with this. So for me, um, I often tend to be like, oh, okay, this needs a sound. I want to make it really cool, you know. I love to, especially in this digital day and age, we like to show off to the world what we've done, especially to our peers. And, mm -hmm. you know, like, oh, look, I made this awesome thing. But you said that that's something that you had to learn over the course um, of of your career, that it's just, you're just there to do the job. To It doesn't need to stand out. Mm -hmm. Could you elaborate <laughs> on that a little bit? Sure. Well, it, it relates to what I just said. Um, and I learned this very valuable lesson early in my career by working with Steve Soderbergh, who is a, a friend of mine and a roommate at one point. And from from uh, Kafka on, um, Kafka was my second film with Steve. And then every time, and that was early in my career where I was that guy, like, hey, look at me. I, I want to make a cool sound. And, and um, well, uh, he used to call me out on it every time because he said that would dis distract the audience and pull them out of the movie for that beat while they marvel at how cool the sound was rather than keeping them engaged um, in, in the storytelling process. And I've seen all those threads from Stephen back in 1981, 82, all the way to Denis Villeneuve in 2016 when I met him on Blade Runner, where we learned that the joy, the, the beauty in sound is often in how mundane it can be. It, it, it actually becomes even more special when it feels so organic that it's, it's, it feels, I use this word, inevitable. It's so right, you don't notice it. And that's a hard kind of Zen place to get to in sound design. It's really hard. It's he, it's, I know Steven Soderbergh used to say every time we'd be mixing and a sound would jump out and he would raise his hand in the mix and say, I'm still here. And that's his way of saying that was Mark saying my sound is still here. <laughs> and that's how we got busted every time. <laughs> that's amazing. <laughs> Speaking of mix. Um, so <laughs> you you're obviously mixing at the moment. And um, we spoke a little bit about it before we actually went live. But I think it'd be really cool also for, for a lot of people to know how does a mix work in like big Hollywood? Because I was surprised by how many people there were in the room. I had no idea. So could you maybe quickly go into that a little bit? Sure. Um, well, there, there's so many 
variations on it. I would say it would be truthful to say that there is on a feature film, and I only, you know, pardon me, I only have one experience for 47 years, and that is making movies. I don't know broadcast. I don't know streaming. I don't know gaming. There's so many other venues for good sound. Um, but in traditionally speaking, movie is shot. It goes into post-production and hopefully sound is involved for some number of weeks while the editor and the director assemble the film. So we could be on for, you know, anywhere as long as three, four months as the editor builds the movie and we're providing sound to the editor to, to symbiotically create the edit. And then you go into a mixing uh, phase and you pre-mix the sounds, usually without the filmmakers, you know, you've built hundreds of tracks or tens of tracks, who knows, uh, and they needed to be artfully combined and panned and equalized and be ready for a final mix. And that pre-mix process can be in feature films as small as three or four days to as many as 30 days of pre-mixing sound effects and dialogue and maybe even music if it needs to be mixed down to be in preparation for final mix when everyone shows up, the director, the editor, the producers, the composer maybe, the sound editors, the dialogue editors, um, some executive producers, and in the, as, is, as is the case as we were talking on the film I'm on, there's about 20 people uh, around, including assistants. <laughs> and they all seem to have an opinion, and that's, that's, a, that's a tricky bit to manage. And that final mix could be anywhere from a week to, I don't know, crazy. Uh, I've, I, I just heard something crazy about a friend of mine's movie where they final mixed for three months. So, oh, my God. God. I, and I know to gamers that must seem like, oh my God, that's insane. Well, how do you, what could you possibly do with all that time? Well, you'd be surprised. That's incredible. Who has then, um, what's, what's it like in terms of like the conversations who carries, because with so many people in the room as well, that must be hard to manage. Is there some kind of, um, yeah, what, what's the dialogue like between so many people and who's, whose voice is the strongest, the executive one, I guess? No, the, uh, beautifully, the director, all of us okay. have learned, at least in narrative cinema, that the director is the conductor. And um, I use that term specifically because um, a final mix, ideally, should be for the director what the performance of an orchestral piece is for a music conductor. You know the music you've rehearsed the orchestra, you know where the, the woodwinds have to come up and you know where the percussion has to, you know, just tuck it down. And the director should be empowered in that process to act like a conductor, to bring up the dialogue, bring down the sound effects. That should not be a moment if you have structured that final mix properly where the director is saying, oh man, I really hate the clarinet in that score. Or what's that rumbly thing? Um, Denis Villeneuve all, used to always say and still says um, he wants, when he gets to the final mix, he wants all of those elements to be what he calls old friends. He's been living with them for six months in the edit. He knows where the music is working. He knows where the sound effects are working. He knows where he needs to hear dialogue and not hear dialogue. And he's delicately, just like a, a conductor, bringing up the dot bring up the dialogue now bring it down let let the music carry us through the scene without the distractions of these little bits of of pieces that he didn't attend to earlier which he which uh, most directors should attend to earlier it should be a beautiful elegiac moment for a, for a director the final mix but often it's not because the most obvious mistake that's made is oh I, you know put some music here because i think i want music but Fill that up with sound effects because, you know, we maybe will just go diegetic here. And then you have a you have a train wreck. And I, I bet you everyone on this uh, watching this podcast has experienced that on to some degree. The train wreck of too much of everything without uh, without focus or direction. Yeah, yeah, for sure. I mean, the, the same goes for games. It's you need uh, a creative stakeholder, someone with the with the grand vision um, to to conduct the orchestra, as you so beautifully put it, because otherwise it it becomes dissonant and everyone goes their own ways. And then 
without it tying in in the end. So yeah. yeah. You know that that what's funny though is that the great re-recording mixers of the world could do that on their own. The gr the great re-recording mixers, even if it hadn't been orchestrated and rehearsed ahead of time, have that innate storytelling sense that this this is what this scene needs. Okay, tuck down the effects here. Here's why. Let's let's bring up the score here that we're really selling the emotion here. Um, that, that just it takes time and experience. Yeah, we've got actually a question from Giovanni. Um, is the director involved from the beginning of production with you and with music composers? Absolutely. I mean, look, a director is off and on uh, is often on as the script is being written, and then a director stays with a project through final mix. That means if you're a smart director, even before you go into production, you probably have interviewed composers and hired a composer. And even though they may not start for, my, for financial reasons till maybe after the shoot is over, but your edit is beginning, um, you're working with the composer and sharing scenes and talking conceptually about what you want to achieve dramatically and how score can support. And um, you know, with directors like Denis Villeneuve and George Miller and, and others, and Luc Besson, um, those conversations can start during production and composers can be writing sketches and submitting sketches and that those sketches, early themes and, and melodies and harmonies can be developed, placed in the early edit, you know, during the, the, the rough edit and that begats a beautiful iteration and collaboration process where, yep, I like the theme, but I don't think the tempo was quite right. Let's go back. And now the editor is adjusting the edit to the music that you know that you, they're going to live with. And all of this starts to inform itself and becomes very organic. That's a beautiful way to make movies if you have the time and money to do that. And, you know, and sometimes, no, nope, you wait till the edit's done, you hand it over to the composer. And then the composer does the traditional, I don't know, 10 week score. And they would still follow a similar process of submitting sketches, making sure the themes are right and the, the mood is right. Director signs off on that and they go out and flesh it out. Awesome. Well, um, in that case, I'm gonna, with that question, I think let's just open it to, to audience questions. But um, before, so while people put their questions in the chat, I would love to, also ask you if there is anything that you would absolutely love to record um, that you haven't gotten a chance to do so yet and also maybe something that doesn't exist that you would record because that's a, a question we've we've now asked a, a number of people and the answers are always really interesting ah you know there, there's nothing that i'm i'm just itching I, i've had so many i've recorded so many things there's very little that I haven't had an opportunity to do. I, I, I'll, I'll turn this just a little bit sideways and say, um, last year I did this beautiful movie called um, Good Night Oppie about the Mars rover opportunity that spent 15 years on the surface of Mars. And while I was designed, we spent 30 minutes on Mars in photorealistic footage that um, ILM created of the rover driving around. And my first charge was to develop the sounds of the Martian atmosphere. We know it has atmosphere, it's a thin atmosphere, but we know there's wind and dust storms and tornadoes even. So I had developed sounds that were terrestrially based until we received communication from NASA that Perseverance, the current rover on Mars, had a couple of DPA microphones <laughs> embedded on it and sent back the first sounds of another planet. That just gave me the biggest goosebumps. Um, th this is the sound of an alien world. And, I took this little 10 second snippet of, of Martian wind and built that out into an immersive um, Martian soundscape. And so, in fact, if you see the movie, um, Good Night Oppie, the very first sound you hear under black is the sound of Mars just all on its own. I just, that just, those are the kinds of sounds I would love to get. I want to go to another planet and <laughs> record what's going on there. Yeah, that's a great answer. I love it, and <laughs> and for sure, I think those uh, that clip I I saw that around it, it made its its round through through Twitter and such. And that what a great idea! I'm so happy that they they put the microphones there. <laughs> so <laughs> definitely, definitely worth it. 
Awesome. Um, I, that's, that's I just saw a fun different. one from Samantha um, about uh, mood experiments. And that, that was a really fun one. That was on Blade Runner 2049, where I, I, I followed the sort of Jackson Pollock model of, of just lobbing sound at the blank canvas, which was my Pro Tools session. And I, I do do that. It's, it's the rare film where, where I can actually get away with that. Um, you know, Blade Runner um, opened itself up to kind of very experimental sound. And for those who didn't, don't know what I'm talking about, I would put the entirety, the two hours and 40 minutes of Blade Runner on a blank Pro Tools session, having spent a couple of weeks designing what I thought of as the sound of Blade Runner. I just made these ambient, tonal, moody pads that were quasi-musical, mostly ambient, but gave you a feeling that made you feel something like safe, anxious. They all had a color. And it made me think of Jackson Pollock lobbing balloons full of paint at a canvas and seeing what worked. And the, the one lob of one kind of color begat whatever he would grab next to lob at the canvas. And it became a very useful technique of, of learning to allow serendipity to drive me towards a, a, an end goal. I would pull a, a, an ambient thing that I made and I would just drop it, you know, like close my eyes and drop it on the timeline. And then I would watch what happened. I would allow the sound and the picture to talk to each other and figure out, well, that didn't really work. But sometimes you got these really amazing accidents of the way these sounds washed across entire scenes like score. And you began to feel a connection that you didn't. It's like putting two and two together and getting five is all of a sudden. Oh, that's really interesting. I never thought of going in that direction. Now I'm going to lob another thing right there and see how those interact. And that was a super useful technique on on Blade Runner. Don't get a chance to do that very often. Did, did a fair amount of that on Dune as well, but it, it's usually something in a genre like science fiction that you can do that. Yeah, no, for sure. It's, um, I, I, I love it. Like we said before the talk as well, it's so cool to get the opportunity to go wild, but it can also be really scary. <laughs> and yeah, it's, it's great. Um, Mike asks, hi, Mark, have you ever used Walter, uh, oops, the chat is skipping, Walter Murch's technique of worldizing any, any of the films you've worked on? Constantly, constantly. It, it, it harkens back to the, the, that very early part of this discussion about, about acoustic sound. Sometimes the way to really bed an electronic sound is to re-record it by worldizing it, by playing it over a speaker and hearing it use the reflections of an acoustic space, whether interior or exterior. And I, I do both quite often to make, to bring a sound alive. Um, on, on Blade Runner, one of the things that Theo and I wanted to do was to build that soundscape to make it feel futuristic and make it feel oppressive was we created these uh, public address announcements. And they're all over the early part of the movie when you're on the ground level of the city. And of course we, we wrote those public address announcements and we recorded them dry in a re recording studio, but we wanted them to feel as though they were outside. And we went to great lengths to re-record them over bullhorns and tannoys and, and bullhorns and public address speakers capturing the uh, acoustics of those spaces. And in fact, our, our favorite, spot was an em while we were at Sony final mixing, we took a few and we found an empty soundstage, a cavernous soundstage and, and played them back at one end and captured them at another end to get these gorgeous two second natural reverbs. So it, yeah, that's a really, really useful technique. Nice. I would say too, that um, I, I've been using uh, one of the great masters of Foley, Andy Malcolm in Toronto, Canada for years. And he does, it's, it's allied to this idea of, of worldizing where most traditional Foley is recorded in the equivalent of an anechoic chamber, a dead room that has no life and no resonance and no acoustics to it. To me, that's a sin. 
it Foley is meant to be diegetic. It's meant to be a sound you need to have because you would hear it if you saw that person walking or reading a newspaper, but you record in an environment that is nothing like the space that, that the, the scene represents. So Andy is one of the few that actually um, performs Foley in live acoustic spaces, giving it life and believability. And I think that's really important. I wish Foley would, would, would kind of up their game and uh, develop more techniques like that. I love it. Yeah, that's interesting. They uh, they did that for um, one of the new battlefields as well. One of those games where they uh, all of the foley was recorded. I think um, in the in open fields and such, so that it feels a lot more realistic. Like oh, that's safe. great. It's so it's so fun. The minute you hear, it's like, how can I go back? How can I do it the old way? Yeah, for sure. No, it's amazing, especially mm. when like the time and the budget allows it and everything. It's so good. Um, Sam MJ asks, "How do you feel about um the design of hero sounds? So something like um picking up a weapon and having it as a big story moment. Um, so I, I'm guessing, mm. kind of having like villain versus hero sounds and things like that. Hmm." You know that I th I think that's more of a, a gaming idea than it is maybe a, a a narrative cinema idea. So I don't have a lot of experience with it, other than you know it's interesting when you have um, a, maybe a gunfight and you have the hero wielding yeah. a weapon and you have the bad guy, or bad girl, or bad person wielding <laughs> a weapon. Yeah. Um, there's so much interesting stuff that you can do to create personality for those characters by deciding which of those individuals, whether they're the hero or not, has the hero sound, which gun is going to, in fact, sound bigger and more powerful and threatening. And even though it is the hero, it might service the story better to make them feel like the underdog by making their weapon feel under, underpowered compared to their adversary's weapon. You know, in, in cinema, I, maybe we got off on, on weapons too quickly. Um, you know, hero sound is, is, a, is, is also thought of as signature sounds. And those are often the uh, interesting sounds that need to draw attention to themselves um, because they're unique to your film. So, you know, it would be something like a worm, a sandworm in Dune or a, or a, a spinner in Blade Runner, or the the war rig in Mad Max Fury Road, and those sounds, you know, require a great deal more attention and thoughtful approach than the rest of the sounds. And often, those are the sounds that you need to have um, regular reviews with the person in charge. In my case, that would be the director. I don't know who that is on the gaming side, but in cinema. I would want to begin the development process and on a regular basis review those sounds to make sure they fit and then begin feeding them to the film editor, having, making sure they drop into the editor's timeline and they learn to live with those sounds and they acclimate to them. There's nothing worse than just designing a hero sound and not allowing the filmmakers to hear it till the final mix. And then it's kind of new and they've been listening to this crummy sound they got off of a CD or a, a cheapy sound library. And, and now you have this kind of temp love syndrome, which I'm assuming people in the gaming industry are familiar with as well. There's those ratty sounds that somebody put in just to get through the night before the sound designer was brought on to do something really good. But there's this weird human um, uh, propensity to fall in love with the very first sound that gets fused to an image and you can't shake it. And um, that's why hero sounds, it's so important to design quickly and get approvals for and get them in front of the filmmakers so they learn to love them. So as Denis Villeneuve says, they become old friends by the time you get to your final mix. I love that. That's uh, the old friends uh, analogy. That's brilliant. Um, Giovanni asks, how does your approach to vehicle audio design work with what's on screen? You say in your masterclass that vehicle nerd, uh, nerds notice when we use different car sounds than what's on screen. What would be the limit of that? Can a Challenger sound like a Charger? Can a Lambo sound like a Ferrari? Is there a middle ground? Or the rule is clear that we have to faithfully reproduce the visuals with the correct sound? 
you know, it's there. there's no, I can't say that there's a rule because we're all living with a, a number of restrictions enforced or not. Um, if you're on a television budget and a television schedule and, and the, they've shot a Ferrari, but you can't, they won't give you the money to sh record a Ferrari. Um, that's not your fault. So I, I, you, there's no, you can't actually enforce a rule other than to say, I think it's incumbent upon us to do the best we can uh, to honor, you know, don't put a Volkswagen engine on a Porsche and don't put a, you know, a Porsche on a Ferrari. Um, I think we, we sense all of those differences, but for the sake of drama, most of the movie going audience wouldn't hear the difference between a Charger and a Challenger. It's a big block V8 American engine with a certain kind of exhaust is assuming it's a, um, uh, a stock exhaust. It hasn't been modified. Um, and I think those are all things we, we can just assume that we can get away with because it's pretty close. And you can you sort of use the 90-10 the, the rule. 90% of the, the audience is not going to know the difference, but will feel as though the sound they're hearing is true to what they're seeing. But I know that the, the inverse, the 90% the, the, the will hear a difference if you put a Volkswagen on a Ferrari. You, you will hear that difference. And I, I, I am as guilty as anyone in a car chase where I, ha I recorded a Ferrari. I have a great, a full workup on a Ferrari, but you know what? I forgot a backup. I didn't record a backup. So I stole it from a Maserati series that I have. No one's going to hear that. And that's absolutely acceptable to do when you can, but you only can do what you, what you, what you have resources for. For sure. It's, it's funny as well, I think, because in the gaming world, um, there's a lot of, I mean, the, the spectrum of car games is big, but, but there's on one side of the spectrum, there's sim racing, which is like simulation where people buy whole rigs and everything. And there it's the only objective is to come as close as the original as possible. Well, well look, but that's really important. And that just yeah. demonstrates my ignorance of gaming. If it's <laughs> a game about cars, yeah, 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 exactly. we're talking about, yeah, you better get it right. But in cinema, nobody's making those judgments and no one has those expectations other than the nuts like me where if you have the time and the money, it's worth it to try to be as faithful as possible. Absolutely. And, and definitely agree with that. Cool. Andrew asks, what's your favorite sound you've ever made or recorded for a film? Oh, this is like asking who's my favorite child. That's... <laughs> <laughs> that's impossible it, it probably wouldn't be a sound itself but it would be the success of a sound that i didn't expect to have um there there isn't one but uh, on dune there's a scene where the worm um it's in the middle of the film comes up from underneath and sucks the um uh um, spice harvester into its maw. It hasn't really breached, but you just see all this sand and machinery getting and people being sucked down into its maw. And I didn't know how to make that. Den Denis had mentioned that the worms are 400 meters long and 100 meters high. And he wanted this big, dry suction sound that spoke to the lack of, of water on Arrakis. And I tried vacuum cleaners and I tried animal breaths and none of them worked. And that was simply me taking this microphone, a little lav, and I just did this. I, I stuck it in my mouth and made a 10 or 15 second suction sound. I just slowed it down and added some subwoofer to it. And that made the perfect giant worm, you know, suction. That's so incredible. It, it, it's when you, you find a simple solution yeah. to a, what seems like a complex problem uh, that, that makes me really happy. This is, yeah, I mean, ugh, that's so cool. <laughs> There's so much texture in Dune as well. I love it. It's like texture is my, my sweet spot of, of sound. I love texture, anything with texture. Denis loves this story. He had, when um, a shout out Mapes um shows the um chris knife 
in the early in the movie, Denis had said, you know, we know from Frank Herbert lore that the Chris knife is made from the tooth of the worm of Shai Halud. And it shouldn't be metal and it shouldn't be bone. It's this unknown substance. And Theo and I struggled to create that sound. And we and he and he threw out multiple iterations of it until one day I was sitting right here working on that scene. And I went to the bathroom to wash my hands. And I slid the soap dish in my bathroom on a, the stone surface of my sink. And there it was. There's the sound. It wasn't bone. It wasn't metal. It wasn't ceramic. It was just this other sound. So I just quickly grabbed like one of those rigs, ran into that bathroom and scraped my soap dish. And that was the sound of the Chris knife. So those kinds of you know, stupid, quick, like, yes, I solved it. <laughs> and, you know, to tell the director, you know what the Chris knife is really made out of? It's my soap dish. <laughs> That's absolutely brilliant. This is, yeah, <laughs> I, I've, I've experienced that before and it's the best thing ever because it's like, it was right in front of you all along, hidden in plain sure. sight. <laughs> you have to listen. Um, I guess as a final question, um, since we're on this topic as well, um, or, or final two questions, maybe because I'm aware of time. So one is, um, did you, someone asked if you were responsible for the creation of the Sardaukar chant and their general voice design? If not, do you have any insight on how it was created? Sure. Um, the, the, Theo and I spent a great deal of time working on that chant, but the, the success came from Hans. Um, there's a, an, an individual on his team that um, invented that chant and did it using a didgeridoo and then some extensive processing. That's a multi-layered, like a 36-channel recording that had the original vocalizations. You know, it's very Tuvan-like with those harmon those multiple harmonics, and then he created these many layers of, of processed, pitch shifted, flanged, distorted, you name it. And we very deftly mixed all of those layers together. However, I will say just to, to toot my own horn, that in that scene where we hear that chanting, the voice of Commander Bashar talking to Peter DeVries is me. Um, early in the film, um, Denis had called me up and said, we don't like the voice of this actor. Could you quickly give me something um, for that voice? And then we'll cast somebody months from now. And it was like seven in the morning when my voice is really rough. And I wrote, uh, just so you know, um, I was a foreign language major before I became a sound designer. And um, I have a facility with languages. So I invented a Sardaukar language and I wrote out phonetically what he was saying in my new Sardaukar. And then I just, you know, gosh, bus buddy, you know, and I, I did these, this goofy voice and it, and as I was saying before, this temp love syndrome, it sat in the edit for nine months and they couldn't <laughs> shake it. No matter how many actors they brought in to re-record it, that's my voice as Commander Bashar. <laughs> it became an old friend. Yeah, it did, exactly. There you go. <laughs> That's amazing. Well, in that case, I, I've seen we've just hit time and uh, I know you have to rush off to mix now, but I just want to say, Mark, thank you so much for sharing all of this knowledge with us and these cool stories. And yeah, it was so fun to talk to you. And uh, yeah, all, all the community seem to really love it as well. We've had a super active chat once again. So yeah, thank you so much. Really, really thank appreciate you, Greg. It. And I'll, I'll just shout out Pro Sound Effects, who markets my library. If you have an opportunity, go have a listen. There's some really nice material there. And thank yeah. you for joining us. And thank you for having me, Greg. It's been a pleasure. Thank you so much. And yeah, just want to say again, also, um, the Pro Sound Effects link as well is is above this video, as well as the Rain Library. So please go check it out and and go check out Mark's other work as well as the libraries it's all super amazing and worth it right i'm gonna end the stream now thank you everyone for joining and it'll end in 15 seconds so when i press the button it'll just kick me out but have a wonderful <laughs> day and good luck with the mix and thanks everyone for coming bye bye cheers